hope you are well rested. And um, so according to the Monty Python, you know, which give us sort of our themes, it's and now for something completely different. So what I'm trying to do is to give you an evolutionary perspective on maybe where language came from, what we have learned so far about the origins of language. Do you hear me okay? Yeah, or should it be a little bit louder? No? Okay. Good. Okay, so um, Peter and I didn't introduce ourselves, but I'm go just going to briefly introduce myself. Um, so I'm a professor at Göttingen. It's a joint appointment with the German Primate Center and the University of Göttingen. And although primate vocal communication has been sort of at the core of my research, in the last decade or so, I really branched out and I included studies of the social behavior to understand signaling behavior better and cognitive testing. So this is kind of still there, but it's not what I'm, you know, continue to, it's not at the center anymore. But anyway, I think it fits nicely with this group, so I'm very happy that I still have this foot in this uh, area, so I got invited to, to, you know, be here. Okay, so, um, there are two parts. In the first part, I want to give you a little bit of background information, a little bit of history also, because the question of language origin, of course, is a very old question. So I want to give you a feel for um, how, you know, what the different approaches were over the last decades. And then I'm going to turn to a classic case that's in almost every textbook on animal behavior and animal communication and it has been picked up by uh, linguistics and so on and so forth and they sort of use it as a reference case. And I'm going to walk you through that case and then I'm going to show you uh, an analysis of, uh, a reanalysis of the old data to give you a slightly different perspective. Um, the first part will be focusing on the signaling behavior. So we have always, when we talk about communication, uh, we, talk, we have these two sides. We have the uh, signaler and we have the recipient. So in the first part, I'm mainly focusing on signaling. That is the structure and usage of vocalizations. Okay, I'm waiting until everybody has found their seats. Okay, so as Nina, aptly pointed out yesterday, we take language for granted. Uh, nevertheless, there is this old human question, where does it come from? You know, how did we humans uh, got to have language? And the various religions have all their accounts um, to provide you with sort of a myth um, how, how humans acquired language, how it was given to us or how it emerged. And then with the advent of uh, scientific approaches, people began to tackle this question from a scientific perspective, of course. And there has not always been agreement that we can actually um, explain language or the acquisition of language through evolution. And there were some very smart people who doubted that language did evolve. So Noam Chomsky, this is sort of, of course, a very short uh, representation, but he said, basically said, it's too complex <coughs> to have evolved. And Stephen Jay Gould said, it wasn't selected for, it's a byproduct. Something else has been selected for, and with the different um, capabilities that our brains had, we were then able to, you know, sort of stumble upon language. But I would say the consensus view today is that language did indeed, yes, I'm not. Okay. Because when you say language evolved or it's too complex, I'm wondering yeah. which, which part we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah, no, but I'm getting to that in like about three slides. <laughs> uh, the current predominant view is that language did evolve or the components that make up language did evolve, but how, when, and why, I think that's still unclear. And the problem is, um, if we want to try to use evolutionary approaches, that we really have scarce evidence. I mean, uh, language is a behavioral trait, 
and it doesn't fossilize. And even if we study fossils, they give us only so much information, for instance, about the anatomy, maybe about brain size, we can make some inferences. But the wetware, we, it's very hard to understand you know, when in evolution, when after the divergence between the last common ancestors in of chimpanzees and humans um, have evolved a specific behavioral trait. Um, because of the scars evidence, people have turned to animals to try to see, okay, maybe we can find some elements that are required for developing language already um, in these animals. And I'm going to focus today on monkeys mostly, but I'm also talking a little bit about apes. In a nutshell, I can already tell you, there are no large differences in the vocal behavior of monkeys and apes. There is no major difference there. Um, the idea to use a comparative perspective is not a very new one. It actually was already proposed by Herder, who was one of the great thinkers in the 18th century. And there was this uh, Prussian Academy of Sciences in Berlin, and they have this prize. That was a way of, what today we would call it program research. So they issued a question, and they awarded a prize to the person with the best answer. And this question was, where did language come from? And Hadda um, produced this treatise, and he said, this is in German, um, the best way to approach it was to, to start with a beginning to, to look at the communicative abilities of animals and humans. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. And as uh, David already pointed out, it's not a monolithic thing, so we have different design features or we have different components, and now it's up to you to help me to uh, list some of those components. Okay, what makes up speech? So now we're starting to see that already, you know, this is very jumbled, and we can also think about different levels of analysis. Yeah? Are we talking sort of from a linguistic <coughs> perspective, or are we talking about something that's more general cognitive abilities that are not necessarily language related, by a, but a necessary precondition to have evolved? And that's, this is by no means complete yet, but it's important to think about this deconstruction and see what are um, perhaps some of these packages have already been in place, have evolved before a language in its fully fledged form that we use it today is, is available. And again, we were not the first people to try to do this. There is one pretty um, approach by Hockett in the 1960s. He made this very funny drawings and he also lists a number of capabilities, including auditory feedback, for instance, which, as you know, when you are on a shitty phone line and you keep hearing your own echo, that it really derails vocal production. So this feedback loop, auditory feedback loop, is also an interesting, important component <coughs> of being able to speak fluently. Um, these are only a few, but um, I, I, I love this paper. Um, they are all, so he also tried to already map some of these abilities or components onto um, an evolutionary tree to make some claims about, for instance, he um, believed that hominoids already had traditional transmission, so there was vocal learning. And we can come back to this question later on. There are also some more recent approaches. This is uh, a very influential paper by Mark Hauser, Tecumseh Fitch, and Noam Chomsky in Science, um, a, a much cited um, review. And they uh, also tried to deconstruct the language faculty. And they said there is the language faculty in the broad sense. Well, OK, here's the big other category. But there would be some basic sensory motor features that are necessary. Then we have conceptual and intentional um, abilities. Very important, this question of the intention to communicate, the intention to provide knowledge. 
and not only the intention to alter the behavior of others is very important. And of course, not surprisingly, with Chomsky um, on board here, um, at the center is uh, recursion. This has been contested. I'm not saying that this is the standard view, but, but that was one, uh, try, uh, one approach or one attempt to also see, okay, what, what is there, you know, and how can we check these different abilities in different animal groups, including then humans. Okay, um, this is basically, in the end, what Sarah Shettleworth called an anthropocentric research program. You start out listing these different capabilities that we identified in humans, and then we try to sort of track back and see how much of this and in which form, to which extent, do we find this in other organisms. And then it's very important to um, distinguish, or what we're trying to distinguish is, do we find a certain trait here that is derived, that's spe specific uh, to this taxon here, um, as a result of, um, because it's truly um, derived, or is it a, due to the result of, is it a convergence? So we also find it, for instance, vocal learning, we find in songbirds, but obviously that's not due to common ancestry here, you know, that's evolved independently. So that's an important issue, what we have to uh, keep in mind. Um, and then we, of course, what we, what we are trying to look at is do we find certain traits, for instance, that are shared with the hominoids or even can we go back further or do we find certain features that are shared with all mammals, for instance. So that's what we try to do. And that's what people call, yeah, we're looking to, for precursors in other species. And that's a tricky issue and I will get back to that in the second part of um, this lecture today. So this idea, looking for precursors of language, uh, did contrast with the traditional view that was um, proposed by Darwin and was, um, was very influential in ethology, that uh, mostly the vocalizations and the facial expressions and the body <coughs> postures, so most of the signals, animal signals, can be conceived as expressions of the emotions, particularly vocalizations and facial expressions. Um, but then, when the psychologists became more interested in looking at animal behavior, they had a completely different tack. So they did not necessarily you know, use Darwin as the starting ground, but they used humans as the starting ground. And then there were different attempts. This is with Vicky. It started um, that people took chimpanzees, young chimpanzees, into their homes and raised them with the family. And one early attempt was uh, the Kelloggs. It was a family. They had a um, chimpanzee Gua, they raised together with their son Donald. And um, the idea was to see how much does the enculturation, the cultural environment, contribute to the development. And where do we see or where, where would they start to identify differences between the ape and the child. And um, the what they found, although they didn't, that was the Kellogg's, they didn't find, they didn't really look at the communicative abilities, they looked more at the sort of the general cognitive abilities. And what they did observe was that Gua didn't acquire any words, but Donald started to make chimp sounds. And at that point, they stopped the experiment and uh, brought Donald, uh, Gua back into the home, into the chimpanzee's enclosure. Um, and the, uh, gardeners, they took Vicky into their home and they thought, okay, well, maybe that's not very conclusive that there was a negative result for uh, Gua because they didn't particularly do any language training. So here they did training, 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 hours, hours, hours on end and try to use positive reinforcement to get this chimp to speak. And here are three clips with the three of the four words the animal learned. That's cup. Mama. That was mama. 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 Yeah, so not very successful. I mean, she's using one uh, sound of her no natural vocal repertoire, the rough grunt, to do the mama. The <laughs> 
So that's the only thing she could do. I mean, what was interesting, you could train her to make some sound and she used her hand. So she clearly understood that something was required of her that she couldn't do. So she helped herself by using the hand to do the plosive sound. But that was about it. Um, and uh, this didn't deter, um, this is Herb Terrace in his 70s. He's a professor at Columbia University and then they thought, okay, maybe these apes are not able to talk, but what if we uh, teach them sign language? Um, so they took this little chimp, they called Nim Chimpsky, um, from its mother and uh, raised it with a hippie family. Um, and it's, for me, there is this film, uh, the project Nim, and I can really highly recommend it. If you want to see the dark side of science, then that's uh, the film about the dark side of science. How cre crazy people were, like no ethical standards, what it means to take an animal out of, from, away mm -hmm. from um, its uh, conspecifics, raise it in a family, I mean, it's really heartbreaking. And um, what was interesting that uh, Terrace was at the beginning, he was a proponent. I mean, he would believed he would be able to teach a proper sign language to, to the chimp. Um, in the end, he became one of the fiercest critics. And there's a book uh, written by Joel Wallman, it's called Aping Language, that really looks very, very critically at all the ape language um, projects. And after reading that, I've also become kind of very wary of uh, the results that are continue to be put out there, you know, that Coco is talking about, you know, I don't know, the death of the kitten or something. Um, so one of these, I mean, uh, that's Kanzi, of course, he's also very famous. Um, this, this was supposed to be a bonomo. He's now a very fat bonomo. He looks like a sumo ringer. I think that's due to the, um, his lifestyle, you know, basically living off M&Ms and Coca-Cola. And um, he has certainly learned to command, you know, several hundreds of these little symbols to get what he wants. So most of them are about requests like tickle me, food, this, 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 banana. So he can, he can, he was trained and, and that's quite, you know, um, impressive that you can train an animal to understand 3000 different commands or something. But I'm very skeptical about his productivity, you know, or communicative intent that he's using this actually to communicate with others um, in a way that's not related to reward. Okay, so these are those attempts to take animals out of their natural habitat and see what we can do if we put them in a training regime, if we put them in a very special um, environment. In complete contrast, there's this other approach, which is more the ecological and evolutionary approach, is to observe what the animals are doing actually in their natural habitat. How do they communicate with one another? And uh, one of the pioneers of this field was Peter Mahler, who was anyway a great influential character. Um, he was uh, British by origin, but then moved to the US to Rockefeller and later to UC Davis. And he can be, he's kind of the godfather of ethological communication research, not only for non-human primates, but also for birdsong learning. So most of the standard model of birdsong learning um, it was developed uh, by, by Peter Mahler and then his fellow, um, all his many students. And for a while, um, it seemed like every professor in the US who studies either birdsong learning or animal communication is actually um, a scholar of Peter Mahler. And I happen to be um, one of his grandchildren, if you will, because I studied with some of his postdocs. Um, so Peter went out um, to study the chimpanzees that Jane Goodall studied. I mean, at that time, the equipment was a little bit more um, inconvenient to carry around, um, but he took some recordings. And at that time, uh, the, what we, or what bioacousticians did to analyze calls, they um, produced spectrograms. And at that time, it took about an hour to get a spectrogram for, you know, 500 milliseconds or something. So these machines were really very slow. Uh, but it was the first way to approach, you know, get catalogs of animal sounds and not just rely on um, auditory impression or 
um, verbal descriptions like chicky 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 or something you know what people like when you read bird guides you sometimes you know chuckle when uh, when you hear these descriptions and um, Peter was very excited when he heard about this st study by Tom Strusaker. So Tom also uh, a real naturalist. He uh, worked in Kenya and he observed vervet monkeys. <coughs> and he used exactly, he produced these kinds of spectrograms, you know, one hour each <laughs> for uh, one second of uh, sound. So he have the frequency, the time, and then very poor resolution at that time, but nevertheless, you get an idea that there are highly variable sounds, that there are these kind of whistle-like sounds, and then there are these um, sounds with higher repetition rates, um, ch chatters and grunts, and, and so on and so forth. And this is a beautiful paper, very old style, very detailed description, and incredibly rich in information about the complexity of these animals' vocal behavior. And one Part of one information that was embedded there was that these animals ha apparently had different alarm calls in response to different predators. But if you read the original paper, it was much more complex than that. So Strusaka already said, okay, if they see one predator, then they first make this sound, but then maybe they make another sound and another sound. So that was sort of forgotten. And the message that they have these three different alarm calls was the one that was inspiring to people, and uh, they t especially to Peter Mahler. And um, he then began to think um, about uh, maybe a reconception of animal communication and uh, questioned whether it was really just effective or whether there was also a symbolic quality to animal communication or to animal sounds, specifically primate sounds. Um, and this culminated in a publication of <coughs> a paper uh, in Science by Robert Seifert, Dorothy Cini, and Peter Mahler. And it fo this paper focused basically on the question, have other species evolved the ability to make systematic use of signals to refer to objects in the external world? So I'm going to now focus on this question of semanticity, so sound meaning link here. Um, then I'm going to talk about vocal learning because that's a prerequisite to have flexible uh, sound meaning. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about intentionality, so the intent to provide information to others. Okay, so the vervet monkey alarm call story, as you find it in the textbook, goes like this. Uh, the animals have three major different classes of predators, terrestrial predators, um, snakes, and aerial predators. And the animals have evolved different escape strategies that are adaptive. So if there's a leopard, you are safe when you're up in a tree in the outer branches. If there's a snake, you're safe if you keep track of the snake, because it's not particularly fast. So you stand by Peterly, you look at the snake, and then you call, you try to recruit your group members and to mob the snake. And when there's an aerial predator, it's, it's the safest bet to be in a bush hidden away. It's not a good idea to be up in a tree because that's where you know you will be picked off when, when you're a vervet. Um, and then there are these three different kinds of alarm calls. These are sort of bark-like and these are chudders and these are called raups, also multi-syllable um, calls but lower frequency. And so now the question was what do these calls mean? And to find out at least what it, they mean to the recipients was to do a playback experiment. So in the absence of the predator, in the absence of any other information, play the sound and see what the animals are doing. And lo and behold, the animals picked the right strategy. Yeah, so when the, they heard a leopard alarm call, most of them, not all, but you know, the majority went up into a tree. When they heard a chatter, they would stand by Peterly, and the raup is so sort of they scan the sky or they go into a bush, depending. It's a, not a huge sample size. There is a much more variation than we tend to think when we read the textbooks, where it's like all animals go up into a tree. That's not true. It's, a, it's about you know, half of the animals go up into a tree, and you know, a third does something different. <laughs> 
Um, but nevertheless, sort of on average, the system works like this. And the early conclusions were that it seems appropriate to conclude that the alarm calls of rivet monkeys designate particular external reference. Do you agree? That's the behavior they're supposed to do. It might also mean climbing the tree or something. Okay. Like a stimulus response kind of. Like a stimulus response. Kind yeah. Of. Okay, so the, the hear the sound and then you go up into a tree, you can't help yourself. I don't think that's true, but it might. I mean, if this is the experiment you have. It doesn't tell you anything about you, about why a, a verbal, you know, this, uh, I read this as saying a verbal monkey is, make, is making this noise because it, it, it's, it's alerting, it's making a reference, but it, it, there's, no, it, there's nothing you can say from this experiment about the intentionality of the, the Why not? If you're shaking your head, why not? <coughs> yeah. The animals learn that when there is a sound, they have to react this, this way. There are also studies that young uh, monkeys have to learn to um, show the appropriate behavior to a certain sound. But it doesn't tell you anything about why the animals are producing those sounds, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the biggest problems here, and it like, took people about 15 years to figure this out, is that there was a confusion they were observing the recipients, and then they were talking about the signalers. Yeah? We don't know what's what the signals are doing, but we're looking at the recipients. Yeah? One could do while crawling, they did it, but just to see if when the, an eagle appears or when a snake appears, if automatically an animal would, would signal these calls appropriately, then you would know more precisely if there's a link between the appearance of the eagle and the call. Probably they did it already, but that would answer your question. So would they do it if there are no other monkeys present with us? That's one question. Um, and no, yeah. So they don't always call. So there is no deterministic link between spotting a predator and calling. And there's no deterministic link between hearing an alarm call and choosing a certain mm -hmm. response. Yeah, either. But even if you did what you just said, you wouldn't know what the animals, what, you know, what other sort of driving factors, what explains the calling. You wouldn't. Okay, but anyway, so we are still, you know, on the positive side, when we, people were really enthusiastic and thought, yes, you know, we are trying to understand this now. And then they said, okay, certainly the calls are arbitrary and non-iconic in the sense that they do not resemble in physical contours what they denote. So the calls are non-iconic. And arbitrariness is accepted as one criterion for differentiating symbols from icons. So can somebody explain arbitrariness and what would it take to show that these calls are truly arbitrary? And it just means that they don't resemble the, the eagle somehow, so they don't make an eagle call or a, a leopard call, which means it's more symbolic, arbitrary, and not iconic. Um, but how we, we don't know how it is to be a verbal monkey and how it is to receive the call of a leopard. Um, can we really say that this is not iconic? I don't know, maybe yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another question. Would there be a different, I mean, we have arbitrary and we have an iconic. Is there a certain other mode of communicating? The different group of verbal monkeys have different calls. Uh-huh. So that would be an indication that it's perhaps learned, at least. Yeah? Okay. So according to semiotic theory, there's a third option that was conveniently forgotten here. It's indexical that it's somehow tied to the causes of the calling, in this case, perhaps an internal state, 
no, you know, that's a different discussion. What is the internal state? But you know, some emotion maybe, some effective response to seeing a predator. That was just omitted here from the discussion. But nevertheless, okay, so this is what they claimed is arbitrary. Um, and to show that it's really symbolic, we would have to show that there is no fixed relationship between signified and signified, as you just said, you know, that there is some flexibility and that perhaps in different populations of vervets, we find different patterns of calling that some use the chatter to desi designate um, the snake, and in other groups it would be perhaps the eagle, you know. Um, and then we would show that it's learned both the acquisition of the proper production as well as what the calls mean needs to be learned. And this is just to remind you about the indexical mode. Okay, um, as time went by, uh, these people backpedaled. They sort of thought, okay, they maybe got, sort of gotten ahead of themselves and maybe actually they cannot make these strong inferences about what's going on in the signalers' minds. Um, so therefore, they redefined reference. They did not say, okay, these animals are actually designating or referring to a specific object or a specific action. All we can say that there is a correlation between signal production and something that's happening in the environment. There are other species, they find particular foods they like, they make specific food calls. If there's a correlation between the signaling and some external event, then we can call this <coughs> functional reference. It's not, it functions as if the animals refer to, but they maybe don't refer to. And that was sort of a trick of keeping the reference, using the, still using the word reference there, that derails many people's thinking because they forget what functionally means, that it means as if, yeah? in this case. So people continue to talk about reference, although we already knew in 92 that it's, we are basically just talking about a correlation. Okay, so then Macedonia and Evans said, okay, now let's just redefine functionally referential communication. <coughs> we can uh, in, um, identify functionally referential communication if two criteria are met. One is a production criterion, that we have a certain acoustic distinctiveness, so, so we have different sets of calls, and these are given in specific situations. So there's a certain predictability of the signaling. And then we have the perception criterion. That means we have to have differential responses. And this is mostly important for us, because the differential responses are all we have to try to gauge what the calls mean to the animals. Because we don't, we cannot ask them, you know, what the calls mean to them. So we just have to look at the behavior. So it could well be that although the animals don't respond differentially, the calls do mean different things to them, but we will never know. Yeah? So that's one of the big problems when you study babies or, or um, monkeys or apes or other animals. It's very difficult to find independent avenues to uh, what calls mean to them. So when we uh, looked at this um, production criterion and acoustic distinctiveness and we discussed the vervet call, uh, we noted that nobody had ever done a proper acoustic analysis to quantify how distinct these calls really are. And um, so Tabby, she was a PhD student in my group, um, she said, well, she would think, given the importance of this case, that uh, it would be worthwhile to actually analyze, do a quantitative acoustic analysis of these calls given by, uh, that were used in the original study. So she contacted Tom Strusaka and she contacted Robert and Dorothy, and they made the calls available. And then there was also this folder with chatter calls that were not given in um, alarm context, but in aggressive context. And in the literature, you could already read that there were these references that they make chatter calls also in aggressive situations. So Tabby added these chatters and also raup calls um, that were given in non-alarm situations to the analysis. Um, 
And we did not have focal data, so we couldn't assess call specific specificity in the sense that we knew, okay, so and so many calls were given in that situation at that rate. Yeah? And so many of these other calls, we didn't have that information available. We only had this big bag of calls and the context in which, were they, were give, in, in which they were given. And this, so one thing we did was a cluster analysis, but here um, we plotted the calls according um, to their provenance, the context in which they were given onto a discriminant function simply because that's, you know, more accessible. And what you see here is this is for the female alarm calls that if you just look at these three types of alarm calls, we find a nice clustering, a very high discriminability of these different calls as um, reported in the literature. So we have here this big cluster of terrestrial alarm calls and then snake alarm calls and aerial alarm calls. And mostly the terrestrial alarm calls consist of these kind of bark-like structures and then we have this multi-element <coughs> calls given in response to aerial and snakes, aerial predators and snakes. So that was all fine and good, basically replicating, you know, what uh, you could read in the literature. But the situation changed completely when we added the calls given in non-alarm contexts. And um, so what we found here is that we basically ended up with two large clusters. One contained the terrestrial alarm calls, so they still stand out. Um, and then we have this big sausage here uh, where we find that the aerial alarms um, the aggression within group, aggression between groups, and snake alarms are um, actually altogether relatively similar. There's a continuous distribution in acoustic features. And the correct classification goes down quite a bit. And most of the confusion occurs, of course, between these contexts, while the terrestrial alarm calls still stand out. And to give you an example, so here we have from the same animal an aerial alarm call and a call given during within group aggression. So these were calls given in two relatively different contexts, but they sound very similar. And this is for a snake, uh, again by the same animal, and aggression. So that's chatta slightly different chatter. So there's some variation there also, um, but there's also some similarity. And you would probably be hard pressed when you were in the field to, you know, make a guess now what's going on. For the males, <coughs> we have um, a similar finding. We find here that the terrestrial alarm calls form a relatively tight cluster. And then we have more scatter and fewer calls altogether for calls given in the snake in the aerial alarm context but still pretty good classification. <coughs> For the males, we didn't have any calls outside the alarm context, but Tabby then went to South Africa, uh, where we can also find vervet monkeys. And there she recorded not only barks given in response to predators, but also barks given in during intergroup encounters when males meet other males and try to defend the territory. And here we found uh, a relatively high similarity between these kinds of alarm calls or barks and uh, not a very high classification. It's not statistically significant. And then some people said, yeah, but you know, some of these calls given in response to leopards were not even real leopards. They were model leopards used to evoke the calls. So perhaps that explains this mess, but that's not true because those calls are all here at the extreme whereas calls given to real leopards are here. So, so that doesn't explain the finding. Um, so again, we see that the calls are much less context specific than we like to think when we read the literature. And that, of course, raises some interesting questions then, how does the system work? You know, what is the evidence that the animals are using, the listeners that are, are using to make a decision on how to behave, whether to you know, try to defend your territory or run up? Um, into a tree. So we can conclude the alarm calls are acoustically distinguishable from each other, that's true. If you only look at the alarm calls, the uh, finding is correct. But there is this overlap that has been kind of neglected in the literature um, over the past decades. And the idea that you produce basically the same call when you see a snake or some other group that you don't like 
is maybe more compatible that sort of the unifying principle is an aversive state, yeah, that you don't like that situation. Or when there is the bark, it's a highly charged, high arousal situation. Um, so that um, is reflected by giving the same call. But um, this is on shaky grounds because, yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that in human languages, we also have many, many cases of words which are ambiguous between two meanings or even two syntactic categories. And quite often, they are disambiguated by context. So the idea would be that we have a limited set of sounds that we can use, and we, we combine them. And when context is sufficiently distinctive, then it doesn't matter that we use the same sound twice. So maybe they have a limited number of calls, and they're just reusing them because when there is an, another group, then it's a very clear context that you're not talking about snakes, but I don't know. Yeah, no, it's a very good point, and I will show you an experiment where we tested exactly that <laughs> in the second part. Uh, so that's precisely one thing that's very important. I think another thing we have to look at, nobody has looked at this before, is what is the contextual vocal information, uh, to avoid the term linguistic information, but that's another way of disambiguating the meaning of a certain sound, is like what is the preceding vocal information you're getting. And I would suspect, but that needs to be tested, that what can happen is you hear what's going on and if you, there's a fight, for instance, within the group, you hear screaming by someone else and if it's screaming, then you will maybe tend to think this is, you know, a, a, an intergroup aggression, intragroup aggression. Um, but what you just said, the context, I mean, the, that's why we do these playback experiments, because we remove or control contextual information. And uh, in this case, it wouldn't help you, you know, to, to distinguish between the two. So you need um, the animals in their natural lives, when you do a playback experiment and it still works, then the question is why? Yeah? Or how, how well does it work? Because they don't have the context to disambiguate what's going on. They have to make a decision basically mostly on the acoustic information. That's at least the idea of these original experiments where they didn't control or they used sort of context was always neutral, you know, as far as you can have that in the wild. But, but could that explain why you don't see, uh, you were saying that the playback experiments give you much more noisy results than, so maybe in the absence of any yeah. context, uh, you see much more noise than... Yeah, yeah, I mean that's what I suspect is going on. And if you watch them in the wild, you know, and if they have perfect information, you know, they're sitting there, they know there's no line around, and you play a line alarm call, you know, they all go. <laughs> yeah, so, and I think probably there's species differences between the value they assign to either acoustic information or contextual information. So if you are an arboreal monkey, and you have no visible or visual information because you're, you know, sitting in the dense um, treetops, then acoustic information is really, really important. But if you're a baboon, yeah, and you have pretty good, you know, you're in a situation where you have good visual information, then that's more important, I think. But nobody has really sort of done a systematic comparison of things, but that's where I think there, there's still sort of promise in the field. Yeah. Okay, so another issue, a uh, suggestion that came from the audience is to look at different populations of vervet monkeys, and this is, of course, one thing that <coughs> Tabby also did then. And she did not only look at um, species, uh, within species or different population differences, but she also looked at um, a congener, another Chlorocebus uh, monkey. So we have here, so basically the members of the genus live all over Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and the Chlorocybus pygoritrus uh, that were originally recorded were here in East Africa and Kenya, and then she added calls from the same species but a different subspecies. So uh, pygoritrus pygoritrus living in South Africa from here. So these um, are separated by 1.5 million years of evolution, and then she also looked at the calls from Chlorocebus sabeus. These are the West African uh, members of the genus. And the calls sound like this. So first is the sabeus. So that's a male leopard alarm in West Africa. Now comes East Africa. 
So there's some acoustic variation, but there's also sort of a joint structure there in South Africa. And if you do a fancy acoustic analysis, you find, yeah, you can tell the calls apart, uh, especially the West Africans are distinguishable. It's 2.1 million years of evolution. But overall, the patterning is relatively conserved. And it's very, it's, it's possible, but not easy to distinguish South African from East African male alarm calls. So altogether, this points to a relatively low degree of flexibility and a very strong innate component. And there, there is no indication that these animals would have, would have a completely different pattern in which they use these calls. And if, in comparison, I'm in Senegal where we have this field station, you know, we have over a thousand languages in Africa alone, and just around the field station there are 11 different languages. So basically from village to village, you know, people may speak a different language. So it's completely different, but it's so different from what we find, what's going on in monkeys or in apes. And if you talk to chimp researchers, West African chimps, panthood, East African chimps, panthood, Central African chimps, panthood, you know, so, and they have rough grunts. So again, the patterns, you know, if you just look at the literature, people always talk about the same call types given in roughly the same context. So also for chimps, we find there's very um, fixed uh, patterns, uh, vocal patterns, that there's no, no, substantial geographic variation. Some ge geographic variation, but it's not substantial and in no way comparable what to what we find in humans. And uh, there's other evidence that there is a relatively little learning going on. So this is a study on baboons um, that I did. This is cross-sectional, uh, looking at age differences in female and male um, chakma baboons. And we looked at the acoustic structure of contact calls. So these are one of the few call types that you can get from both sexes in all age classes. You know, mating calls, of course, would only be in adults and some other calls. And, um, adult males don't scream or very hardly ever scream. But contact calls can be um, recorded from, from um, both sexes in all age classes. And this is how the females sound. So this is, whoops, about from a, uh, you know, maybe a, a week old. So this is a pattern that's there from birth. When the mom walks away, the baby sits there, does this tiny version of the contact bark, and nothing much changes, and all that changes can be explained by growth. Yeah, about 90% of the variation can be explained simply by that these animals are getting bigger, so the larynx is longer, the the lungs are bigger. In the males, it's a bit different. So the males produce calls that are disproportionately lower in frequency, longer, and they add the second syllable, which appears with the onset of puberty. So as testosterone kicks in, they have this flourish, this male flourish, and males in good quality have particularly loud and long second syllables, and they use these calls also as alarm calls, and they use them also as display calls when they're running around each other and trying to impress each other. So we see here that, uh, firstly, we, there's no sex difference when they're young, and then we see sexual selection at work on these kinds of calls. And this, these are aspects that have been uh, kind of neglected because people were so obsessed with thinking about whether there are similarities with human language or not that many people overlooked things that would be immediately obvious to somebody who studies um, bird song, for instance, from a behavioral ecology perspective, yeah, where people are much more interested in thinking about um, natural selection and sexual selection operating on a sound system. Okay, um, this is not to say back to, to the primates, it's not to say that there is no variation whatsoever. There is substantial intra-individual variation. And uh, sometimes it can be quite predictable. So this is a study on olive baboons in Nigeria and Uganda by Elodie. Uh, she was also um, a PhD student in my group and, and then went on to become a CNRS researcher in France, uh, studying mice now. Um, and she compared 
the changes in the structure of the grunts. So these animals grunt all the time and also when they're moving and this is a way of sort of keeping in touch. And she compared the structure of these grunts when the animals were tr transitioning from an open habitat to a closed habitat with poor visibility. So it was the same animal, just you know, different environmental conditions. What happened? And she found that these animals in both, in, it's a small sample size, but two different populations, Nigeria and Uganda, that they produced uh, consistently longer vocalizations when they were in the uh, poor visibility habitat compared to an open habitat. So within subject, there is some variation and some predictable changes in some patterns. So perhaps fundamental frequency can also change, although it didn't in this um, study. Uh, but duration is certainly something that is, you know, can be to some degree um, changed by the animals. Despite all this evidence that there is little, you know, vocal uh, characteristics uh, or li little vocal learning going on, <clears throat> you continue to see, you know, papers that make a big deal saying, okay, no, now for the first time we have found evidence for vocal learning in the functionally referential food grants of chimpanzees. So first of all, okay, now, you know, is that still special to have functionally referential calls? Perhaps not. Um, the original study was only one chimpanzee, but never mind. Okay, so, and then this was all over the show, you know. I, I, I think I got like, you know, 10 media outlets contacting me. Do you want to comment on this fantastic study? Now for the first time, now we know how language evolved and so on and so forth. And I typically declined and said I had no time. But then I looked at the data and I, what they found was, it's actually an interesting case study. So they had two groups of chimpanzees. One was housed in the Netherlands and one was housed in Edinburgh Zoo. And these animals were brought together um, in Scotland. And uh, they found that the animals that came from the Netherlands, Bergen Bit, this is BB, and Ibro is Edinburgh, uh, that the animals from uh, the Netherlands that were brought to, uh, to the group of the Scottish chimps, started to talk like the Scottish chimps. And they did an acoustic analysis of these rough grunts. They sound like, ah, ah, more or less. Um, and this is a principal component analysis. So basically what you see here is that uh, the Scottish chimps don't change their acoustic features and the uh, Dutch chimps sound more like the Scottish chimps in the end. So there's significant differences here, but there are no differences there. And I asked Simon if he would make, uh, Simon Townsend, if, if he would make the data available to us, and they did, which was really nice. And, and then if you replot the data, uh, simply, uh, uh, so here are the individual calls. So firstly, they only had three calls per individual. Um, then you see that many of the Dutch chimps already produced calls that fell within <coughs> the range of uh, the Scottish chimps to begin with, and that there were only three animals who, who produced calls that sort of fell outside the range. So it's a very, very weak evidence. And then if you look at the changes over time, you see that in 2011, we still see that these animals are outside here. We still see that they're outside here. And another thing that's not immediately obvious, but it comes, uh, if you look at this, the, the error bars become smaller. So these calls are all much more consistent. They're more, more similar to each other. And um, so in the end, um, this is statistically significant. We did the same statistical approach. We found it's also significant, but if you look at the data, I think it's an artifact. It's, uh, it doesn't mean that all the animals start to sound more like the uh, Scottish chimps. So um, we wrote an article which was published and they wrote a response. They sort of maintain, we said there are several problems. One is that there is not, um, no change, uh, no substantial change, that we still have some animals that produce calls outside. The other is that they didn't rule out excitement, so perhaps the 
chimps from uh, the Netherlands weren't used to be fed apples. So when they first were fed apples, they were more excited and maybe produced calls that were um, a little higher pitched and therefore, um, and then they became habituated over the many years. But that's not true. They already knew apples. So also in Holland, they have to have apples. So that's, you know, comforting to know. Yeah. <laughs> so, and um, um, then it was a question, it sounded like, okay, so the, the Scottish chimps were the residents and the Netherlands chimps came in, the Dutch chimps ca came in and they had to be accustomed. So they started to speak like the Scottish chimps. And, um, but that was not true. They were all together transferred to a new enclosure. And that for me raised the questions, why did one group stay consistent and the other group did not stay consistent if they were not residents anymore because they were not staying in their own habitat. So, you know, it doesn't make sense to me. And um, I cannot give you the uh, answer, but there is something odd with this study. But certainly I don't think there is any good evidence for true vocal learning, yes? Um, is there, would you say that there's evidence of more uh, plasticity of vocalizations than people had previously thought? No. So this? No. I mean, that's another thing. I mean, there had been these studies on dialects in pan foods and it's within the species-specific range. We're talking about a few hundreds of hertz. I mean, there's squeaking or grunting and then they squeak less. Basically, that's what happens. Yeah. Okay. So, but it's no other call type. Yeah. So you predict that if you bring in two animals from sort of similar area, brought up in a similar environment, but not together, you kind of just see the same effect with them in a new, but different enclosure. I mean, the evidence is really mixed. There are some studies by Chuck Snowden um, on, was it Marmosets, Steffen? Marmosets, right? Yeah, so there they had all sorts of different patterns. So some features became more similar, others became more dissimilar. So you can have these effects, but you don't necessarily see that there is call <coughs> convergence all the time. But there is always, you know, over and over, we find that some groups sound a little bit more similar to each other than to others. So there is perhaps some effect there, very subtle, that animals do become, do sound more similar, like in Japanese macaques, for instance, or Barbary macaques, we found the same thing. Uh, but nobody has really looked at the mechanism so far. So, you know, what facilitates this? Um, and that's actually an interesting question, I think. Okay, just briefly, because I'm already going over time. Is there any evidence for grammar? So um, that's of course an interesting question, is particularly in light if you have a limited set of elements, maybe you can generate more meaning if you, you know, combine it in an intelligent fashion. And this is one of the studies. Um, this is uh, Campbell's monkeys. They produce two different kinds of um, alarm calls, although I would claim that these are two variants in a continuum, but they're called hack and piaus in the literature. And would you say, would you think there could be a rule underlying or how would you describe such a patterning? Different arousal states of the animal in context to a arrow predator and a ground predator. Yeah, so um, I would say it's probabilistic and that in one context they're more likely to produce more calls of the one sort than in the other, but it's not certainly deterministic. I mean, you can have a, uh, also some hacks here and more piaus, but you can also have just piaus when they see an eagle. So, you know, you just, you know, it's not predictable, fully predictable, it's probabilistic, um, but it's certainly not rule based. And this variation is meaningful. You can do playback again with sequences. So animals do integrate information over several calls, you know, and then draw inferences about what's going on. So that's an interesting finding. It's not just one call and then you make a decision. Often you wait for more information and that can be more calls, yeah? But it's not in any way similar to human syntax. Okay, so in sum, there is a strong innate component in the structure of non-human primate calls. This is very puzzling to us because we don't understand, you know, what happened between you know, the split of the last common ancestor, the chimpanzees and us, why are they so limited and fixed? And why do we have this ability? And when did we evolve this ability 
to use auditory information, remember it and use it as a template to produce sounds and then come up with new sounds even, you know, so then also have this flexibility to use these phonemes and generate new words and what so, and so on and so forth. And nevertheless, there's some modifiability, but it's very limited within the species specific range. And just briefly, in terms of usage of the calls, it's by no means reflective. I mean, we already talked about this, but for instance here, this is a study where do animals uh, take the recipient state, uh, attentional state into <coughs> account when they signal in a different modality? Do they use visual signals also when the other animal is not looking at them? And you see that they do shift. So if the anim other animal is looking at them, they tend to use more visual signals than auditory signals. Whereas when the other animal is not looking at them, they use mostly auditory signals. So there is some flexibility in signal usage. It's not, they're not automatons, right? And Stefan is going to talk about um, uh, in which way you can train animals to produce certain sounds on command. He's going to talk about that more uh, this afternoon. And I think um, we'll make a break now and come back at um, 10 if that's possible. Okay?